the last step of this interesting morning and afternoon. And I was very happy to hear from CERN something about the first um, keyword on that list, which is called blockchain, in terms of technology. We shouldn't be always required to understand when we drive a car out of which material the road is, either tar, cobblestone, or concrete, but it helps to drive the car at a certain speed with a certain um, characteristic. And whatever we've seen so far with respect to ICs, cryptocurrencies, drive is on the road, which we call blockchain, obviously. So I'll give you a very quick introduction and motivation why the very first generation of blockchains in terms of Bitcoins are here. You all know that we have replaced our telegrams by the end of 2017, just a couple months ago in Europe, from a paper-based physical object into a fully digitized version, which is called email. Well, email is out there for a couple of years earlier than that, but it's a clear representation in digitized form. Secondly, we have seen over the past all sorts of collections of knowledge, know-how, information, um, collected in large books, which moved into a digitized age as well, and that ended on Wikipedia. I'm not judging Wikipedia as good or bad, I'm just saying information is being digitized. And so those systems are operated in a network environment that use a distributed approach, as well as open to everybody. There's no central unit which makes those things work or not work. And those two elements form the basic of our internet, but we couldn't make any sort of commerce on that. All sorts of e-commerce was based on external situations where some type of central element was in place to make us help exchange money. Well, that's partially correct, only because in the 80s and the 90s, then over Z cash, what it was called was the first form of digitized money, which used, unfortunately, a central element. Because when you just send a bit string, and I told you, well, this bit string tells you it's worth a thousand dollars, why would you believe me? Not necessarily me. You would ask somebody else to make sure that this is something which you can spend. Unfortunately, that time frame, credit cards appeared. And credit cards were a sort of digitized form of doing payments on the internet. So all those systems basically disappeared. They were not out there since then. And we waited for another two decades, basically, until that empty spot was filled in January 2009, and that name was mentioned on January 3rd, 2009, when Bitcoin came along. Bitcoin was one of the first instances in the sense that we have a digitized form of money in a fully decentralized format without any central control. And the underlying technologies, they are called blockchain was not very directly used, but it forms our basis. So, to make that work, we easily remember what type of abstract data types computer scientists use. And the idea of using paper sheets, as CERN was doing it, is a very nice one. But a typical A form is called records in computer science, where we have basically elements which are linked by pointers. Like in the library, we inform that you find the book on XYZ on shelf L11 whatever, the floor 13. And that type of pointer is connecting those elements together here in the blockchain on a singular linked list. And that's the abstract data type to make things work. Secondly, we can link those lists backwards. We form the pointers from newer elements to older elements. So we basically build up a history of things which happened. And this is exactly going in the situation which shows are called truth. Truth in the sense of time. Something happened and was persisted in that link at a certain point of time. It's not telling you anything about that um, bluish content. I can tell I am now in Seoul, that's most likely right. I could tell I'm now in Zurich, which is most likely wrong. Nobody will justify any of those statements, but it was set at that point and put it in the blockchain in here. And you have the next words, the sequence by adding numbers, time points, timestamps, whatever. So at the end of the day, that type of approach is called distributed ledgers, less blockchain, which is partially the insurance discussion of the name in there, but that's a side effect, because distributed ledgers basically include something which is called a digital record of the who owns what relation without any central storage. So whatever I've shown you beforehand is not stored on your machine and my machine only, it's stored in our machines, everybody's on their route and somebody else. So 
there is a replication in, in place for good reasons to ensure that this type of information consistent is not only available on your machine and put the data in there. So the decision is who can agree on what is to be placed in there. Again, the record, the container, not the content. The container is then basically ensured to be always on all our copies in the world the same by having those consensus mechanisms on board. And proof of work is one which Bitcoin uses. There's a couple other ones, I come back to those ones. And we have to have obviously write access and read access, otherwise the database, the distributed ledger would not work. So we must need to um, make sure that so-called miners in the proof of work concept, they calculate hashes and those hashes are secure in the sense that it's very difficult to calculate those hashes afterwards at a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of energy. And uh, having said that, then everybody else can basically ensure that you have outgoing data because you can read the data. It's an open public ledger. It's accessible and by everybody. It's typically in the idea of a blockchain world with respect to the Bitcoin cryptocurrency open for everybody. Because I need to make sure that I have a, that I've, uh, have a Bitcoin sequence handed over to you or to you that you can blame me of spending that money twice. Double spending shall not happen and that will be private. No chance. And then the key characteristics of that very simple approach is that we have a distributed system, anyone can participate, unknown stockholders, they have no relation at all beforehand, it's open and immutable. Having said that, we need a couple technology ingredients, and we all know them. At least we understand to a certain extent that cryptography, cryptography especially public, key cryptography and hashes help. I'm not arguing that they're always perfect, because we have seen cryptographic solutions being broken by like MD5 in the past. SSL had a number of problems. So our technology, there is a certain status which makes us believe when we use that, it will work together with other systems tomorrow and the day after. We have to be careful. Secondly, we need a network behind that. That's a distribution aspect. We need to have a distributed system where everybody is able to have access to the exchange of data to make that blockchain work. And basically, a peer to peer system is used for that purpose. In addition to that, the question is what does the data science mean to persist in such a blockchain? In the blockchain case, well, the Bitcoin example, it's basically a fund transfer from account A to account B for the value of one Bitcoin. So basically, two account lines plus a value for the transaction. That can be done a certain number of times per day, and the volume grows. But the volume grows quicker than the density of our hard drives being produced today. Thirdly, those miners participating in here, ensuring that data is persisted in the blockchain, need to have incentives to help out because miners are not only doing it in a single instance, there might be a couple dozen miners taking the same block and trying to persist it in there. So they have a reward. In the Bitcoin blockchain, they get Bitcoins at the end, if they have a valid block. I'm not talking about all the different other problems of that, but the principle that is the idea. Having said that, there's two types of blockchains around there. Well, one open one, which is the public permissionless blockchain, basically open to everybody, you and me. There's no limits. Everybody can participate. That's the idea of a blockchain invented by Nakamoto, basically. We have no prior dependency on any trust. And that's why Surin called it a trust machine. Because everybody can participate and we sort of doing things over time and if you look in there, it seems to work very nicely as well. So Bitcoin is the grandfather of our blockchains. Ethereum basically is already a father, maybe a child. It's difficult to tell. But there's nothing beyond that before you get in that position. That is the real and only blockchain to my mind because it's open. The other choice, which people always call blockchain as well, is called the private or permission blockchain. It has one very clear difference to the other one. It only allows permissioned known stakeholders to do the mining job. Would you trust mining procedure of persisting data in blockchain? on any people I select for you? Only maybe if you know me. 
If you have never seen him before, you wouldn't trust a millisecond on the approach. So that's why this type of private permission blockchain is not a real blockchain. It assumes that there is a trusted set of miners in place. There are good reasons why you may want to have that. If you trust your government, if you trust the third party, if you trust this and that, there might be good examples. But in general, to my mind, this is not a blockchain. It's just a permission way of handling data in a distributed fashion which not necessarily is required. And there are some sort of hybrid solutions. And then last but not least, if you persist that they are in here, it looks like that the content is very stable and static. No. Even in the Bitcoin case, you already had a very small contract because I did say deduct from account A one Bitcoin and add that to account B if specified. That is a very limited contract though, but it's smart in the sense that once you persist it in the blockchain, it will be processed. It's like a bank transfer, where the bank transfer was happening on the machine of bank. Here it's done automatically. That's why it's sort of sort of smart initially, because you have the way of to have an active database. Think of a database which starts doing something on its own when you input data in a certain row. Very nice, very nice, very dangerous at the same time. In addition to that, smart contracts are old. They're older than 20 years. Maybe more than they were asked to sell. Because Nick Zabo in 1996 mentioned smart contracts are computerized transaction protocols to minimize the need of intermediaries to get rid of a third party in between any two potential stakeholders. The problem at that time when he was defining that one was he didn't have the right technology then to make that work. There was not the right idea. Computer scientists didn't have that idea at this point in time because that type of infrastructure wasn't there. And it appeared to be that a blockchain is a very ideal infrastructure of <coughs> technology to make that happen and work. And today, such smart contracts basically at best have the power of being Turing complete, which means whatever you're able to program in any known programming language today can be programmed in a smart contract. But, but just think about the following situation. Who of you did ever write a program longer than 10 lines and those 10 lines function perfectly well after you've done it without any error corrections. That's very hard to be done. Perfect, some people do that. But the majority has problems with that. And as soon as a smart contract is persistent and it shows errors, those errors will remain in the future. So it's very hard. We decided, as you was observed basically, to push into the blockchain idea a startup, because we believe that besides those sort of semi-critical remarks I made, it is an interesting approach. We founded Modem.io, and basically it was driven by a very specific UK use case, the goods distribution um, regulation, goods distribution practice basically, um, emitted by the European Committee in 2013, requires that all medical drugs being transported between the uh, distribution place, I'm sorry, within the manufacturer and the wholesale needs to be temperature controlled, 100%. And we all know medical drugs in many cases are not required to be temperature controlled, but that's regulation. So the use case was very clear. Um, we basically decided to fund and found a company beforehand to try to solve that problem by using that type of persistent data because in that regulation you would be required to open up such type of quality measurements to the health auditor in your specific country. Because if there would be complaints, you would need to show that this type of temperature was always between whatever 5 and 25 degrees centigrade. And so we basically started and had a passive monitoring solution at hand, which used blockchains to persist data and IoT sensors, temperature sensors to collect the data. That sounds, at the beginning, quite interesting, and it did work. But then, of course, very quickly, the persisting of the full data set in the blockchain was simply too expensive because the value of the Bitcoin or ethers we placed it on top were just going up and up and up. That didn't really help. But in any case, we sort of got rid of that and placed the data in the off-chain. But the cost of making those transports just in boxes with those sensors 
is manifold smaller than compared to a truck which you have to cool and send between any manufacturer's place and also physically. Why did we do that? Well, besides the fact that we are university and research oriented, research oriented, we're happy to be in, in Zurich to ensure, based on university as an ETH's profile, that we have high quality research as well as education in place. So we have a whole bunch of students in there who are always happy to work on real life projects, especially on projects where the new technology comes up around the corner. And we're basically involved in Bitcoin related blockchain related work since 2013, so five years experience on that, with all sorts of different things on Android apps to make Bitcoin payments below one second. And as you see here, a couple of things of food chain project with our federal office for agriculture, for instance, as well as a whole bunch of mitigation measures, etc. Not going to detail here, but trying to continue and saying, well, we were basically able by using our energy and uh, force of students to set up the modem's architecture, which then flow into that SMZ, SME's foundation procedure, and we had a very, very clear business case at hand. Um, that was important because you need to sort of persuade, persuade investors to make things move along. And that was the outcome. We basically ended up by now with 14 employees in Zurich. Five of them are from my old team of students. Five board members, one is my old postdoc, and four senior advisors is myself. And uh, the important was that the blockchain and IoT combination was quite helpful to combine the supply chain um, requests in that specific situation. And we continued to do a tamper-proof sensor development because as soon as you have non-digital assets which you need to grab and sensor from real life and generate a bit string out of that then the first problem appears. Because who tells you that the sensor is taking 22 degrees of real, 22 degrees and not doing just 15 to be on the same side. So we developed a temper-proof device to ensure that even by fiddling around with that device, you will be able to identify that. And our content in that blockchain will be persistent and correct. We were happier to basically get through a couple accelerators, um, um, programs and we're happy to fund ourselves with initial money but then went into an ICO in September 2017 just uh, before the regulation of FINMA in India but, but we did fully comply sorry um, fully comply to the know your customer approach um, out of those 13.5 um, million US dollars equivalents of the bitcoins we only were unable to identify two bitcoins plus minus an audience that ended up in Swiss transactions on the Swiss bank. Because you need for a company an operational bank account in a Swiss company. And the Swiss bank obviously that was important. So that is a quite success uh, out of that perspective. But I would like to sort of draw the line now to check on the blockchain situations with the to challenges and risks. Challenges to our perspective are those elements which need a little bit more thought and brain power to be most likely solved um, successfully. I mentioned this uh, situation of non-digital assets. There are solutions, as I mentioned, with respect to the sensor case. But in general, we have to make sure that this is possible for other examples as well. I always make an example. I mean, if you own a house, if you own an apartment, if you own a property, how do you generate the bitstream out of that knowledge? that you can persist on the blockchain without using an external storage of a qualified document like the GPS coordinates we just had beforehand. Because you need to align them and make sure that this is something you belong, that that belongs to you. In Bitcoin it's that easy because you have a private key, or a public private key pair, which you can always produce. Here it is public knowledge, so we have to find solutions. Now we talked about the situation about sustainability from the perspective of energy today. Blockchains, especially Bitcoins, just that single and only blockchain out there in the world uses already the energy demand of Iceland as a, company, as a country for 2017. And it's projected to use or require the energy of the Netherlands of 2018 and 2018. And it's only a single blockchain. Everybody and each of you would like to generate one more blockchain 
who will be able to generate that energy to make that work. Just the question mark. Sustainability is an issue we have to think about, especially in times of sort of more um, sustainable oriented thoughts in the world. Scalability is an issue, which partially was mentioned. We talk about seven transactions per second, roughly, peak time for bitcoins. Other blockchains talk about 600, maybe 1,000. But if you want to replace systems by blockchains today, for instance, credit card payments like Visa or MasterCard on the day before Christmas, they have 20,000 transactions per second to be maintained. We are far off that goal yet. I'm not saying that's impossible, it's really most likely to happen, to make it work. Standardized APIs become important because if you decide to use an Ethereum or Ripple or US or whatever type of blockchain, if you need to move and don't want to have a lock-in effect, APIs, application program APIs, become very important. And we have seen a number of economic impacts already in impacts being mentioned today. Our computer science department is part of the economics faculty of the University of Zurich, so we have lots of economics experts around us. And um, what is the role of an e-currency? Sweden announced the e-corona just a couple months ago. What will happen? One of my colleagues looks at the distribution of bitcoins in the sense of looking at virtual coins, how long do they remain in a single account? How many units and subunits do you need to do your payments? They like, to, they like to sort of apply that to real currency. How many bills of a certain size, how many coins of a certain size do you need to print and mint to make a society work? Interesting question, although I doubt that the e-currency model would be uneasily met in the real world, but in principle that's correct. And we've seen a whole bunch of legal regulatory requirements, and we have to ensure that our society at the end of the day is accepting the issue because the consensus mechanism at the moment, if it's proof of work, is based on probabilities. Probabilities only. Would you trust your bank account in general that with a 99% probability your monthly salary, salary payment comes in, or do you need 100%? Just think about that for a moment. I'm not saying that it's 99% bad, but as soon as your own pocket is sort of attached, we have to make sure that we really believe in this is like that. And security privacy, that's what I mentioned, the first ingredient. Whenever things go wrong, they typically go wrong, as Murphy tells us, um, we don't know what the attack vectors will be tomorrow. 51% of text on blockchains are well known. If 50% of the miners would collude, then it would persist data according to their needs and overruling that truth machine. It's unlikely. I'm not certain about the two, twice times the lifetime of our solar system, um, especially if energy prices in certain countries in the world are so cheap. Take a look at the miners being populated in the Bitcoin case in one of those countries. It may have an interesting effect to look at. What happens if those security algorithms will break? Well, if you're persistent, your property in such a blockchain, and it's sitting there for the last 10 years, and it's broken, how can you prove afterward because it's still my property? With Bitcoins, I bet that doesn't matter if you have a Bitcoin lost 10 years ago. With well, your property, it might be of interest. And what happens if such algorithms will be broken because quantum computing pops up? We're talking 40, 50 qubits today. Those machines are extremely costly still, but we know how technology has shifted over the past. I don't want to sort of frighten you, just think about that for a second. It may take ages, but there will be a time limit when those albums like Indy 5 had to be broken or will be broken as well. I'm oh, sorry, and do we have anything beyond proof of work? That seems to be the only consensus mechanism at this very moment which is really immutable. Proof of state, proof of authority, proof of activity, proof of XYZ, all show at the end of the day a much weaker either immutability, security level, or are potentially easy to fake. And that's obviously not the idea of a blockchain, to see that happen. I'm not seeing any solution of that at this moment, but let's see. And, in Europe especially, the GDPR, the Privacy General Data Protection Regulation, took off a couple of weeks ago, May 25th, and it says explicitly that you as a private person, as an individual, 
shall be allowed to identify to any IT system and operator who runs that system that this data has to be deleted because I don't want it to be in there anymore. For good reasons, bad reasons, not arguing. Blockchains are immutable. GDPRs are just the opposite to that. So we have to think about the solution. You may have to sign explicitly a legal statement before and indicating whatever I put in that IT system and will be persisted forever. Will you sign that? Would I sign that? And last but least, the network's reliability. What happens if a distributed system is suddenly cut into two halves? I'm not saying north and south, I'm not saying east or west, I'm just saying in two halves. Or even two uneven halves. What happens? Do we have knowledge of the same blockchain for the future? If that interrupt happens for a few minutes, probably fine, a few hours, probably fine, a few days, maybe longer than a week, or even forever. The blockchain as a technology might have severe difficulties to end. And we talked about the economic legal consequences of the ICUs and tokens. I'm not repeating that right here. So we looked at a whole bunch of drawbacks and advantages, basically using those characteristics all up front here. And you basically are not able to see very quickly where always the pros and where always the cons are. That depends on the application. That depends so much on the very critical situation. And if you take a look at those, you have perfect blockchain support. Our friends from the ETH basically did define a very simple flowchart on running through, on looking on the application to decide if the blockchain makes sense or does not make sense. Because you look at three or four questions and it can indicate very clearly if you will have a benefit at the end of the day. As an experiment, you can always do it. But the benefit may be sort of difficult to, to be reached. So blockchains do show a very logical evolution of computer science. Sometimes you read papers about revolutioning the computer science world. No, it's just a simple, very simple abstract data time where you add um, cryptographic mechanisms to ensure that those pointers, those links, are secured at the cost of higher processing demands. That is a trade-off. That trade-off had to be thought about, thought about very carefully. But it ensures immutability. You can't have um, the five-cent piece and the row at the same time. Secondly, we are very sure that blockchains work as long as our existing security measures do perform correctly. Those are the ingredients of our today's technology. I mentioned the quantum computing. I now probably even say threat coming up. It's a threat to security. But remember, 99% of our IT systems today use public-private key cryptography. And we will have much more difficult problems to solve if that technology is broken than just a few blockchains. So our IT, IT society, especially in the banking sector, will have a very difficult problem with that abuse. Although there are a few algorithms which are quantum computer proof, but they are not fully tested yet, of course, because the machinery is out there, not in a state that you can use it for all the cases. In theoretical terms, we are on the same side. But as we all know, between theory and practice, there's only a difference. That's the practice. And last but not least, maybe a little in contrast to what I've heard so far, blockchains are no revolution at all. They are no revolution because those abstract data types, as I mentioned, of linked lists, just make sure that you add the cryptographic hashes, and then you have a distribution impact in there, which is probably not really, really necessary. And that's why I state very lastly, it cannot be a revolution because I've not seen a system which was completely put out of service and replaced by a blockchain-based system. Bitcoin is out there, I still see banks. Very simply spoken. I'm not saying that this might happen. So the projection Sir mentions probably right now, but I'm very careful in saying that we are on a disruptive level right here because revolutions typically change systems overnight. And they didn't do that either. Thank you very much.